Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. This is part of the Scubani e-commerce mastery series where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. Scubana is a software platform to manage your entire e-commerce operation. Today, I'm very excited. We have Scott Scharf. He's the co-founder of Catching Clouds. It's a cloud accounting for e-commerce businesses, specific for online and e-commerce businesses. Scott has been in IT for over 30 years, working with global to small businesses. Scott brings the technical side of things, while his co-founder and wife, Patty, is a CPA who provides the deep accounting expertise. Scott, thanks for joining me. Thank you. You know, you have so much. I watch a bunch of interviews, videos of you giving advice to, and there's so much, so many questions business owners have. So I want to start off with some of the, which you see probably a lot of the biggest mistakes e-commerce businesses need to avoid. Oh, uh, specifically e-commerce businesses. Mm -hmm. I mean, the first thing is you've got to treat your business as a business mm -hmm. and put a reasonable amount of time into putting processes into place. So if you've optimized how you're shipping and fulfilling your products or you've optimized how you list or select products, You've got to focus on the business side. E-commerce mm -hmm. businesses are all about commerce, generating money, and you need to manage that money so that you meet your own goals. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really, it's, and it's finding that balance and great. I know that most e-commerce business owners and most business owners did not go into business to do accounting. Okay, they not did not. Sexy. Yeah, they did not go into business to complete sales tax returns, and a lot <laughs> didn't go into business to pack a lot of boxes because they really enjoyed packing boxes every day. Um, so those are some of the things they look to outsource our accounting and other pieces. But unfortunately, business owners, you have to do it yourself for a little while when mm -hmm. you're starting out so that you understand what it is you're outsourcing. Yeah. So I want to talk to you about outsourcing. But so what do you see when you say, how are people not treating their business like a business? What are you uh, seeing? Uh, they're running their business out of their single bank balance. You can't run your business because you don't know what liabilities you have looking at that. Okay, They haven't implemented uh, accounting. Okay, and, and that's not fighting and slogging your way through QuickBooks Desktop, which is one of the most painful products. Horrible. Ever. <laughs> Just, I, I'm sure there are businesses that have gone out of business. So if I can save people from QuickBooks, they're better tools. So if you're a modern e-commerce business selling on Shopify, Amazon, doing stuff in the 21st century, you want a 21st century uh, cloud accounting platform, and we recommend Zero, and that's xero.com. Mm -hmm. It's easier to use. I'm not an accounting person. I get in and move around it, and I'm able to do things as a business owner. Mm -hmm. It'd be much more effective. And then you find the right tools. And so the core tools that you need are a good cloud accounting. Mm -hmm. The other piece that we include and that every business need is a solid cloud inventory ERP solution mm -hmm. that connects to your channels where you generate a purchase order. So every time you buy something, you know what you're buying and you capture the cost. When you receive it, you know what you've received. And then all of your orders and all of your data flows down and it can optimize and provide a structure to your business. I'm not really talking accounting. I'm just talking about process, okay, which means you could train your wife to do it. You can hire a virtual assistant to do it. You could outsource it to someone like us. The idea is that if once you have that structure and you want it to do things in leverage technology so you don't have to hire 20 people to do things, you right. can have a small team making great profits. Um, and then those tools, if you have a cost for everything and every sale from every channel in one place, then we can pull the accounting data off the back end, the cost of goods sold and the value of inventory, which is cash. Keep in mind, if you have a hundred thousand or a million dollars of inventory at Amazon FBA, right. that's your cash that you're not paying interest on. Right. Some of it's making you a profit and some of it's costing you money in storage fees. So it's those two key things. And then there are a number of other tools that you need to help optimize things. But those are the core, a, a solid cloud accounting tool that you use and connect to your banks and automatically pulls in data and a cloud inventory that pulls in all of your sales and orders. Do not expect your accounting tool to be a multi-channel inventory management tool. Mm -hmm. it, you're just setting up everybody for failure. Yeah. So, what mistakes within the process? And you know, the, I know you. I checked out your your tools section of your your website. So you you provide a really good description there of some of those those tools, which we'll talk about because I want to hear your personal opinion. 
But um, what do you see people making mistakes within the process? How are people making mistakes within that? Um, so there's there's one of the big accounting um, processes. Once you have all this automated technology, is you set it up and you can forget it. Mm -hmm. So if you're connected and you're pulling in all of your bank feeds and credit card transactions and the PayPal feed, and so you know what's going in. And most of these tools have you the thing where it recognizes it and you hit okay, 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 okay. That's great. That's like the first step. But what an accountant does or what you need to do is you actually have to get the bank statement via PDF. And I'll tell you about one of my favorite tools that saves us so much time is a tool called HubDoc. Hmm. Connects to Chase, Wells Fargo, Verizon, Comcast, all of these sites connects and automatically downloads your bank statements. Hmm. So when you connect, it'll grab the last two or five years of bank statements wow. and you have all in one place. So the big accounting thing that when we go to clean people up is that you have to compare what came through electronically to what the bank actually says in any other statements because there can be some drastic differences and that's where money disappears on them. And that's the piece that they're not finishing um, is the first step. And then the other thing is just not being careful. You can be simple about how you code that data so that you actually end up with a financial that you can actually read even right. with accountant and understand it enough to work for you. So it's the missing those steps. And then there's a world of things we can talk about on sales tech. So Scott, stay on that for a second. It's really interesting. So once people implement that, right? So they yeah. implement zero, they implement HubDoc and, and they kind of see it. What are some of the big takeaways you've seen people get once they have it in one place? What, what are they seeing then on the kind of data level? Okay. So, I mean, the big thing is, and, and you know, our mission statement is to provide um, e-commerce businesses current, accurate, and actionable information mm -hmm. so they can make great decisions. Right. Okay. So, if you can trust your numbers, one of the big things most people can't answer, okay, if you told somebody, you have to go on the Shark Tank in five minutes, right. okay, would you know those numbers? If you met an investor that's willing to buy your company but if you can't tell them your sales and know how profitable you are, yeah. if you don't have that comfort level, you're not sleeping well, or more importantly, telling your spouse or your partners or whatever how the business is doing, you've got a gut feel. Once you have that number, you're going to be able to relax and you'll understand yeah. numbers is, is really kind of the key thing that people want to know. Is your business profitable? Mm -hmm. Okay. How much money do you owe? And then the big thing is, is how much cash is available? okay to spend on marketing okay because people have to find you even on Amazon you can't not market if you market you'll be more effective on Amazon or your other site if nobody knows about your Shopify site and your URL no oh, one's wow. gonna be able to buy it um, and then you know and then how how much cash do you have available because the last thing you want to do is go yay I can pay myself 10 grand okay but you forgot you have payroll of 8 grand next week right. okay Mm -hmm. Or you pre-ordered a bunch of product from China that shows up for next week for twelve grand. So mm -hmm. not only do you have to tell your spouse that, oh, that ten grand I took out that you needed to buy groceries with or right. a new. We're not car, eating this week, right? We're not eating this week. I have to take that out and an extra two grand because I forgot about that. You know, it's painful. Painful. It's managing that cash flow and looking ahead enough to make smart decisions. It's both the comfort level of knowing if you're profitable, okay, and you look to your accounting system because you want to look in the right place you want to talk to the right people about the right questions but if you look in your accounting it's going to tell you how profitable you are okay it's going to tell you how much money you have invested in inventory and it's going to show you where you're spending your money and where you can mm -hmm. cut expenses or you go wow I'm not spending enough on um, marketing it's those decisions mm -hmm. then you look at a cash flow tool that's going to help tell you how much cash you have going in and out of your business for the next few four six weeks out to make those decisions to say okay I can spend 50 grand on inventory okay and then and then in three weeks then I'll pay myself okay or mm -hmm. okay now I can increase that you want to do that um, and so you know those things and those are the key things you go back and forth it's about both the cash flow management which is different than the accounting okay the accounting answers certain questions and cash flow accounts it. and it's understanding those two things and those are really the two tools Beyond that, for e-commerce businesses, then you want your cloud inventory solution. It should give you the analytics on the profitability per SKU, mm -hmm. the profitability on your orders, the profitability per channel, okay? And it should show you the velocity of how fast things are selling. So which are my top five products from margin perspective, but which are my top ones 
that are selling faster that I can turn over every three weeks, okay, or six weeks. Um, you want to look at it for the bot. What are the dogs? Which are ones that are sitting in inventory and you're paying warehouse fees that you're mm -hmm. going to lose money on if they sit in a warehouse for three months? But if you sell them in under two months, you make a profit. And then you should sell those off on eBay. And those are the different, those three tools accounting, core accounting, be able to understand that, cash flow management, and then the cloud inventory. There are other dashboards and other tools that you can use to do different tasks like listing or repricing or other pieces. But when you're looking at how your business is doing and making decisions, those are the core. Yeah. No, thank you for that. And yeah, I want to get into the software, but first I want to talk about, because people are at different levels and you probably see people at different, different levels or people come to you and maybe they're not ready for, for you. So can you talk about some of those issues? Like when is someone ready to implement these solutions and what they should be doing to kind of build up to that, that point? Ah, so uh, my opinion is the sooner you implement the systems, how much easier it is to do. So if you're a smaller business, keep in mind zero is going to cost you thirty bucks a month. Okay, even that's, if it's yeah, that's, that's not a lot. Okay, you can do that. Okay, so um, it's not going to do there. Skubana is going to cost you per order, so it's going to cost you almost nothing, which I think is a great intro fee, even though they're really powerful for higher end sellers. Mm -hmm. I think that's great. It means that your costs are going to be fairly low to get a really powerful tool. And when you grow and you're making more money, as long as you're getting a reasonable margin on your products, then it'll cost you more. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so you and you've got a few of these other tools. So expect you're going to spend. Keep in mind you're going to spend if you budget a hundred to two hundred dollars in tools. Okay. You maybe use Inventory Lab and HubDoc and Zero on the accounting, payroll. If you have to do payroll and you're an S corp. Uh, Zen Payroll is going to cost you thirty bucks a month, yeah. okay? and then four more dollars for each employee per month. Okay, before even three years ago, if you're buying software, you're spending hundreds of dollars up front or thousands of dollars. I mean, it's amazing what you can get for a hundred to three hundred dollars, and just build that in as overhead. Okay, because the automation will save you time right there. And so, really, it's. Be a business. So my basics for any of these businesses, not only tools, are be registered with your own state, get a federal EIN, have a separate business bank account, keep your business and personal finances separated. But that means that even if you're, it's okay if you're using your own personal credit cards to fund your business and buy inventory for capital. That's totally normal. Everybody does it. But when you use one card, only use it for business. Don't be buying groceries on the same card. You want to keep them separate both it makes it easy for the accounting and it'll make it easier for you so use one credit card for personal expenses and one card and then build the business stuff then register for a sales tax license in your own state you want to be completely legal where you live and where you're registered as a business and then set up the basic uh, cloud accounting okay cloud inventory and sales tax management like a tool like taxjar or taxify.co or the two that I work with depending on what size business you are and what you're doing um, and then there's a bunch of other add-on tools depending if you're an Amazon seller or if you're doing drop shipping or you need shipping management. There's, there's a range of other things, but those core and, you're, and you put those fundamentals in, spend $100 to $150 a month on basic tools and do your best is going to be better than just ignoring it and even better than running things on spreadsheets, even if you're going to keep track of certain things on spreadsheets. And there's yeah. my basic guidance for really any business then you can hire a virtual assistant or an accountant or somebody else can then clean all that up if you're doing it at least in a consistent way mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you know Scott you have a very technical background I was reading um, I think your majors in college were physics math and computer science <laughs> and so I was like this guy should be like one of the founders of Google like not an accounting program but um what do you find with Skubani you have a very technical background what Obviously, you recommend different tools. Uh, tell me a little bit about your experience with Skubana. Okay. So Skubana has been right in the background. So one of the key things I do is not only evaluate cloud accounting tools and other back offices, I've evaluated and looked at over 30 cloud inventory platforms. Mm -hmm. And I've got a huge matrix that compares them all and figure out because whenever I meet a business, I find the right solution 
for the right company. And, mm -hmm. and then I have a high bar and then I provide technical feedback. Um, but looking at these tools, I, I'm, and I was a product manager and ran teams of developers in my past as well. Right. Um, and so I'm very picky about the user interface. Okay, and there are a few fundamentals that I that that I expect in a certain product mm -hmm. that it's easy to use. Okay, I don't care how complex the ta task is; the technology should make the task of doing what you're trying to do um, simple. Okay, it should abstract all the complexity, not be a cool complex computer program, and make the task complex too. Okay, yeah. and I really think Scubana, from a flow and a speed of being able to get the job done and make those decisions, both make the decisions and automate it. So the key things I like about Scubana is when it connects to um, uh, dynamically and quickly to all the key channels. You know, multiple Amazons around mm -hmm. the world, Amazon.ca.uk, um, integrate there. Shopify, Big Commerce, um, uh, eBay. Um, and then it's got an automatic, very fast about pulling that data in. Because what a cloud inventory do, should do mm -hmm. is you have one vision of the truth. The number one thing it has to do well is it has one vision of the truth of what inventory you have. Okay? Right. So I have a thousand widgets in stock, and I'm selling on eBay and my own Shopify site and Amazon. It needs to sell. If I sell 500 on, e on Amazon, it should tell Shopify and eBay that I only have 500 left as quickly mm -hmm. as possible so you don't oversell. That's like the number one thing because otherwise you have sellers out there hiring virtual assistants to try to chase their sales. So it dynamically provides that. It pulls in all the orders mm -hmm. so it's what you've sold and then it keeps that available stock up to date and alert you when you need to buy more of something that's making you money and selling faster. Okay? Yeah. And then it needs the ability. The other thing that's unique or, or, or where, what Scubana does very well is they've incorporated all of the shipping. In many other cases in cloud inventory solutions, what people are using is Shipping Easy or ShipStation or another third-party tool that's, that connects and helps you filter and save pricing, um, save costs on shipping, okay? Yeah. So if you have a product come in and you're in the middle of the US, sometimes it's cheaper to use UPS to ship to the West Coast and FedEx to the East Coast. And it changes all the time depending on where it's going and, and everything else. And it'll do that. Scubana does that internally. And, and really automates that process with some really smart rules. Not a lot of these tools have the same type of rules engine that OrderBot does to say, look, if it's under this size and it's being shipped this way, always ship it in a uh, plastic you know, bag, care, you know, bag mailer. If it's this, do this. And it, it builds those functions. You can build those unique things that I always do it this way because our customers like it or it's the most cost effective or fastest way to do it. And you can build those very complex rules in just like, you know, mm -hmm. better than what Outlook ever had for rules for your email. Um, and so that's something that's really impressive. Also the ability if you sell on eBay to tell eBay anything that comes in from eBay, ship out of Amazon, okay? And have Amazon fulfill that for mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. That ability to I see, yeah. the rules to do it automatically for you or the ability inside the user interface to look at orders as a human and say, you can automate it, but you can go in and say, no, no, send it that way, send it that way. You can very easily direct where things, send that to my West Coast 3PL warehouse, send this one mm -hmm. to that. And you can do it manually for a while. And once you figure out the flow, then you can automate it. And as soon as you get into the automation, not just collecting all the data, but automating and that's where I think um, Scubana yeah. really shines, and it's that automation that will accelerate a very fast e-commerce business. Yeah, and you know, I ask not necessarily to make it a, a Scubana commercial or anything, but I think it's important to talk about some of the key metrics that people are looking at, and also different automation that sh people should be thinking about in their their e-commerce. Because you you uh, list a, a bunch of different um, softwares on your site: Zero, HubDoc, Zen Payroll, Scubana. And then you also uh, bill.com is that's a similar one to is that similar to Zen Payroll or what will people use that for? Zen Payroll's payroll for companies. It's awesome, super modern. No, bill.com is bill payment. It basically is your electronic checkbook. So mm. we clients all over the U.S. and we want access to their information, not their money. Okay, but yeah. people don't want to write checks. Okay, and, and checks are going away. A lot of things are done via credit card. But if you want to write a check, what happens is we get a bill from a, a vendor. You bought a bunch of product and you owe them net 30. Okay, it goes into bill.com and then the bookkeepers can review it and approve it. You could have your operations purchasing manager 
see it so it has multiple mm. levels of approval so that your your purchaser can look at it and say when you get the actual invoice and say no they weren't supposed to charge us shipping or no that's not right or they sent us an invoice from another client I mean all these things that happen but the the, the purchasing person can say yes that's correct and approve it or put comments in yeah. and then it goes to the owner the owner is the one when they approve it and they can be on the golf course with their smartphone they can be wherever they can be at three o'clock in the morning look and say a pay 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 and that's them signing their checks. Mm. And it's done. Okay? Gotcha. In our case, we, it goes to our controller who makes sure there's enough money in the bank account to pay them. And then Bill.com pulls the money out the very next day. So keep in mind, you don't get the float anymore for all those yeah. checks. Bill.com does. Um, what happens, and then they will either do an electronic payment if somebody signed up for ACH, or they will print the check and mail it, including if you're sending, uh, ten, you're paying 10 bills to the same vendor, it'll combine them all into one check mm -hmm. and send it off. So it, it gives you the multi-level approval, it gives you check printing, and it gives you ACH um, payment capability. So it's an add-on to optimize that. So we, have, yeah. we don't use it for every client because we have quite a few that do everything via credit card. Yeah. or wipes. So it's not for every business, but for a business that wants to replace the checkbook, it provides levels of accountability. Mm -hmm. It's just awesome. Yeah, and I would encourage anyone, obviously you talk about these and you list them on your site. It's catchingclouds.net backslash tools they should check out because you have them all listed there and some description there so they should check that out um you know i reached out to a few i want to hear about big messes that you've had to clean up but but i've because I, i'm sure you have a lot of horror stories to tell um but i reached out to a couple sellers i'm like well what questions would you ask scott what are the biggest pressing questions and okay. two things kept coming up yeah and you probably hear this all the time um, one is the third, they wanted to know third party soft reporting software that would figure out profit. You know, if there's like an Amazon tool, that's good. Or they need, I don't know if it's a combination of what you just talked about. They need to do all of those together to figure out the profit. You know, what, what are the different combinations that you suggest or, or what you already suggested? Okay. So, um, all right. So if you're looking for profitability, per SKU, you should expect that from your cloud inventory like Skubana or Stitch Labs or Trade Gecko or mm -hmm. OrderBot, okay? Mm -hmm. um, if you're a purely um, Amazon seller only, mm -hmm. you can look and get a reasonable P&L, a profit and loss, okay, out of uh, Inventory Lab, okay? It's not a cloud inventory tool, so it's not going to manage your inventory. It's just going to give you information about the both the margin on each each both SKU and order and the ROI for those. Mm -hmm. okay, so that's at the front end. That's the SKU. Mm -hmm. And then if you want the profitability per channel, okay, mm -hmm. so your gross profitability. So on Amazon, I sold a million dollars and I had $600,000 in cost of goods sold for all the products I bought and then minus the Amazon fees. What What's my profit on Amazon compared to Shopify where you're paying 2.9% for fees, mm -hmm. okay? And that'll give you gross before your overall expenses, payroll, rent, shipping, and everything else. So you can do gross margin easily. Mm -hmm. Where you get the answer of your actual profitability for your business is in zero, is in an accounting platform where you have a P&L, a profit and loss that shows all of your income, cost of goods sold, gross, mm -hmm. then all of your expenses, payroll, and everything else. And then that'll get it to you. And how you get that is having an accountant or yourself do a detailed close where you look at every single item, reconcile every bank account, and that's where you get the profitability per um, for the business. So it's mm -hmm. it's different levels, and you should expect different right. tools. Right, so, right. And, and then there are different tools like Forecastly that does some really great, that's a new tool in beta that does some analytics around Amazon. And there are other tools mm -hmm. depending but basically, for the most part, you can look to your cloud inventory for profitability per, per SKU, mm -hmm. and it's like what Skubana does, and then your accounting system. And those are the, those are the two places to get those two numbers. Yeah. You're probably trying all the new software as it comes out. Um, so what's big messes you had to clean uh, up? What's your, I don't know, favorite uh, stories is the best uh, way to phrase it, but. Let me, let me think. So we do an initial assessment, and we do a, we can't, we can't say the word forensics because we're not forensic accountants. Uh, but we do a detailed review mm -hmm. of uh, the books. Um, oh, what are some of the big messes? Um, 
Uh, a lot Tell of me things, some horror stories. Yeah. Uh, well, horror stories, I mean, you, you come in and you look at somebody who thinks they're doing okay yeah. and they're missing four or five of their credit cards. Okay? So, so they're ignoring tens or hundreds mm. of thousands of dollars of debt and they just, it's, they're just ignoring it. I mean, they have the bills, but they, it's not in their accounting. So one of the things is not having everything in their accounting. Mm -hmm. Um, what are the other things? I mean, well, we, I mean, we find accounting where everything's coded wrong, but the biggest nightmares that we run into yeah. are sales tax liability. Okay. Mm. Amazon FBA. So Amazon's fulfillment by Amazon where you ship your products and they're a warehouse logistics company. Okay. Not just a marketplace where they sell stuff and everybody comes to you to buy stuff yeah. is that Amazon, um, creates sales tax nexus in 15 states for these sellers. People might want to put their heads in the sand and are going no and they'll wait for the Marketplace Fairness Act and Congress to do something. When they do anything, they're just going to make it worse. And the word amnesty is nowhere in there. And so what we run into is people that have been doing business on Amazon for a number of years. Mm -hmm. We use the tools like TaxJar or Taxify to pull in all the transactions for the last few years look at when the first time they shipped something out of Texas. So September of 94 was when they opened, or 93, I think it was 94 that they opened that warehouse. So before then, if you sold anything to Texas, you didn't have Nexus in Texas. And we've seen businesses that have owed two to $300,000 to California, not the other 14 states, and that's money they didn't collect when they made the sales. They don't have $200,000 sitting in the bank that they'll never have the money, okay? to pay and almost every seller that finally if they choose to uh, uh, collect they collect going forward and if they get audited then that's the risk is that they're unaware of the sales tax liability that that and there are a bunch of sellers that have just said I'm gonna collect in my own state and you can choose to say as a business that it's too expensive for me to collect in that state, both whether it's paying mm. an expert. Because you have to file in every state that you you're have to in. File in every state. So it, you know, you've got to register in the state. Then now once you're registered, if you do it from day one, you're just paying the overhead because you basically take the time or money to collect the sales tax, you put it in a separate account, and then you send it off to the state. If you do it from day one. Once you get behind, that's where where the real challenge is. And if you're going to sell your business, and you either have to disclose that and say, well, there's $100,000 in liability. They're going to take that off the amount. Now, they may not choose to be, get legal, but they're not going to pay you if they know they have this liability if they get audited. Now, the chance of getting audited is fairly low, but it's continuing to go up. Uh, from accounting mistakes. Uh, that, let's stick on that for a second, Scott, yeah. because that was the second thing people said. You know, The one, first was the reporting, the third-party software that figures out profit, and the second major concerns was the sales tax piece. So yeah. are you saying anywhere you ship goods to, if it's you have like, maybe you're shipping goods to two Amazon warehouses, you should be collecting sales tax in that state? So the way it works is where you have Nexus. So you have Nexus in where you have your employees, so where you are, mm -hmm. Where your employees are, so if you're back east and you have, you're in New York and your employees are in New Jersey, you have sales tax nexus in New Jersey. And where you have property, not just buildings, but your inventory. Hmm. You own your inventory until the consumer receives it and signs for it from FedEx. Hmm. Okay, Amazon, it, if you're on a seller central account, Amazon's not buying that product from you. You're sending it to them. You own it at their warehouses. What happens is even if you ship all of your inventory to one Amazon warehouse or it's 101 or more items and they tell to send it to two or three warehouses, right. they dynamically move it to all 15 warehouses. Mm. Okay, You have no control. Well, you, there are actually programs you can pay more and, and have Amazon keep it to a minimum warehouse, but then you pay more for shipping. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. It's, it's, it's the pro-con thing. Do you reduce your, your piece? So where you have Nexus... Um, and then you can't collect sales tax until you have a license. You're not licensed to collect sales tax. So it is right. criminal to collect sales tax if you don't have a license. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. It is criminal to collect sales tax and not give it to the state. Okay. And so the next big thing we see is that somebody will be selling on eBay, Amazon, and their own Shopify site. Okay. And they'll give their data to their accountant. For or well, Amazon's usually the hardest, but they'll, what they'll do is they'll give their data for uh, Shopify and eBay to their accountant, and not file the 
five thousand dollars in sales tax they collected through Amazon. Mm. Okay, so they, what they do is they collected it properly in all three channels, and then they didn't add it all up from everywhere and send it all into the state. So we'll run into people that are like, "Hey, you collected ten grand in sales tax that you never sent to the state. You need to fix that right now." <laughs> And you need to find that. Do they money. typically get a letter from the state saying you owe this or, or not really? So so here's the channel. So the, the challenge is that, no, the chance of being audited is very slim. I mean, keep in mind, there are two and a half million Amazon sellers. So if we're talking about Amazon sellers, there are two and a half million pro sellers. There are maybe 200 to 500 auditors in each state, okay? And they're focused on... Um, uh, they have to by law audit the big companies, you know, the Fortune mm -hmm. 500, whatever companies in their state. So there's only so many left over to go after mm -hmm. e-commerce sellers. Um, and so that, that's just the reality of what's out there. Pennsylvania is pretty harsh about sending um, uh, emails out or letters out to everybody kind of as a, 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 like shock a blanket thing. thing. Yeah. Well, and, and I mean, seriously, what most – Counties and cities going for state. If they were a individual or a business, it would be a shakedown. Okay, because most states, like all the local cities around here, when you have employees, they'll send you a letter that says you owe two thousand dollars in tax. Okay, and we say we're a and we get these too. We're a services business. We don't have to pay sales tax or pay tax anywhere except to the state once a year as right. our income tax. Go pound sand. Okay, I mean you've. Put on the letter we write. Do it. The other thing is, is any business, another tip, if you ever get a survey that says, please complete this survey to see if you have Nexus, okay? You can look at it. If one of the answers is absolutely less, you know, yes, you live in that state or you have a 3PL warehouse, say yes. But on any other case, don't check a single box. Put a cover letter that says, we do not have Nexus in your state because you can't answer the survey without saying, yes, you have Nexus. Mm. Okay, so it's the governments do a bunch of stuff where they shake everybody down. Wow. And don't just trust the numbers. They might say you owe five thousand dollars in tax, and you look at your thing and you owe two hundred. Okay, right. you fill out the form and you send them two hundred dollars, and you're done. But yeah. they'll send you a letter that says you owe five thousand because they'll just guess. Wow. So these are these are some of the things. It is it is painful. It is complex. It can be expensive. Um, but it's a reality for e-commerce businesses and you need to take the time to be aware of what's going on and then you make a decision on a risk management decision on whether or not you collect or file in any state where you have Nexus. Now, Scott, are people coming to you freaking out or are they coming to you being proactive? Uh, I get both. Okay. Um, I get both and I do run in uh, mo more and more people these days. Are, are aware. They're on Facebook groups. They're on, uh, they work on different, you know, different groups. So I'm speaking at Jim Cochran's uh, CES uh, show in a few weeks in Kentucky, and I'll be there in their experts area answering sales tax questions. People are being more proactive. Yeah. I have to say it's so complex that there are quite a few people that just can't get through the complexity to make a decision. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I run into people that are absolutely aware and say, you know, hey, I'm going to only pay tax in my state, you know, you know, forget it's the commerce clause, screw every other state, okay? Um, they can take that position and until they get audited, it's not going to get challenged. And right. you're only going to get audited state by state. You're not going to get audited by every state. Right. Um, and so we run into different levels and what I tend to do is I make like this conversation. I try to educate people yeah. for their decision. If you're going to sell the business or you can't sleep, unless you're completely compliant and legal, right. then you should absolutely comply. Right. Otherwise, you should balance the costs yeah. to the impact to your business. Yeah, it's a risk management decision is what you're saying. Um, so what other big messes that you had to clean so, up? Um, uh, uh, it's the fact if you're not using a cloud inventory tool, you have no idea what your cost of goods sold are and you have no idea the value of your inventory. Hmm. Okay. And so you, you literally, they have no idea how profitable they are or how much money. And then if they're not even looking at the value of the inventory, that I have $100,000 invested in inventory, they may or may not be making you money. Then they're making the next big mistake of not analyzing that inventory and mm -hmm. selling off the bottom. You know, it's the 80-20 rule. You know, it's, you know, 20% you know, of your products are making you 80% of your profit. And the other part could be costing you money and losing money, okay? 
Um, oh, God, accounting things. Um, oh, uh, People just do all kinds of stuff. I mean, one, they don't realize that personal property tax returns are actually for the business. So if you own computers and scales and printers and all those other things, you actually have to complete a personal property tax return and submit those once a year. Oh, uh, we've had massive things when people start hiring people are doing 1099s oh it's the it's great that you can hire people one trick is if you pay all your 1099s via PayPal PayPal submits those 1099s because the people mm. that sign up to receive the money register their social security number or, or list that they're out of the country so that's one thing that's one way to not have to do uh, 1099s at the in January mm. okay just use PayPal uh, yeah, um, and then we run into people that just do payroll wrong. Uh, the owners pay themselves wrong, and they just impact their tax liability. The other, probably one of the bigger things I see is, uh, one of the challenges I see, and this is something I'm, I'm really passionate about, is when the only advisor that a business is talking to is their CPA, they're going to tell them to structure their business to reduce their income tax to the minimum and that's mm -hmm. the only way they're running their business now there's a couple impacts to that okay yeah. one, you're not showing profitability to you as the owner you feel like you're not making any money because of the way you're doing things you're trying to show you don't make any money so you don't pay tax well then you don't feel like your business is making money because you're trying to reduce your tax and that's your main priority well is that really your priority I understand as one of the multiple priorities one profit for the business two a sustainable long-term business three Minimize sale income tax to a reasonable amount. You don't want to give the government too much, okay? But what you'll do is you'll see someone that's only talking to a CPA and everything they're doing, and then they can't get a loan because they show so little profit. A mm. bank's loan because the way they're structuring their business, and you want to find a balance. So that that's a big one, and you want to, it's find the right person. So you want to talk to an accountant about setting up your accounting and a bookkeeper that's going to keep things up to date and have that right mindset. Mm -hmm. You're to a CPA about your tax planning, both personally and business, and have a few rules so that things work out the way you want. So you're not surprised by it, okay? If you're looking, so we do all the tactical stuff and deal with today, not just the past. Accounting's typically looking at the past, and we try to do everything in real time, so it's all about now, okay? Yeah. And we'll go out four to six weeks, and most people themselves will project things out, but people start to say, well, what do I have to do to plan not just for this holiday season, but for next holiday season? Because mm -hmm. I want to double and then double again. You want to talk to a virtual CFO. You don't need to hire a CFO, okay? Um, you can talk to a virtual CFO, and that's what they do. And they're virtual CFOs, and I partner with some that, that focus on e-commerce businesses, that understand inventory. They'll help you get that long-term financing and funding. And it's, it's asking the right person the right question. Mm -hmm. um, and then take the time to read the books, you know, whether it's E-Myth, Revisited. Uh, the big one I'm reading that, I, that we're going to start buying and sharing with all our clients is Profit First, hmm. um, which is... Who which wrote I, that? Um, Mike Michaelowitz. Hmm. Um, and uh, I know somebody who knows him. I'm going to meet him here shortly. But it, it really, it, it, in my view, it helps because people don't know how to budget. Even if you use a tool like you need a budget. So I'm married to a CPA. I haven't had to balance a checkbook in two years. It's awesome. Okay, pros and cons. Now, she tracks every penny I right. spend. Okay, so there are pros and cons. What is this, Scott? What did you buy here? You're, you got you to gotta basically give an explanation. Well, well, the thing is I mostly charge everything. So she yells at me if I went to Wendy's. Like, you went to Wendy's for lunch today. <laughs> it's like, fine. It was one thing when I traveled for business all the time and like, you went to a steak place or you went out for seafood when I'm in Boston or whatever else. I'm like, well, I was in Boston. What else am I going to eat there? Um, and so it, there's that thing. But it's the, even when you know budgeting, okay? So if you say, well, I'm only going to spend X amount of money. What people do is they budget for their issues now and there's two levels of budgeting there's the how much should I budget for what I'm paying month to month to month okay the car payment oh, I know I'll think of a business one but a car payment let's say with your car you have gas okay you have tolls you have repairs okay and then Insurance, you have yeah. for the car if you have it well if you add all that up and say last year I spent five hundred dollars in repairs okay or twelve hundred dollars in repairs well that's a hundred dollars a month well people don't budget for that they budget for right. you know the car payment of three hundred dollars and twenty five or fifty bucks a month for gas, not the hundred dollars a month for repairs. Right, right. 
And if you don't put that away, and the same thing applies for business is that, and then you have to look at, oh, well, you know, I want to be able to buy $100,000 worth of inventory in August or September to get me through the holiday season so I can have a great holiday season. Well, if it's $120,000 in, you know, September or $90,000 by September, that means you've got to set aside 10 grand in January, February, March, April, May, right. okay? Right. Or know that you're putting in ten thousand a month and generating profit, so that you have that ninety thousand available, either in credit or preferably cash, in September. And it's it's just taking that mindset of planning ahead. It's the next level of once you have accurate numbers, you need to budget appropriately, and you have to have a process. And Profit yeah. First provides what I think is a good way to budget for it. No, oh, I'll check it out. I listen to three to six per week on Audible, so I hopefully okay. it's on Audible. Um, so two things you, I want to follow up on with what you said. The virtual CFO sounds interesting. Any rec any resources to point people towards for that? Um, yeah. So uh, um, it's it's um, so there's Dan, which is with I can't rattle off his uh, site, but I'll be adding him if anybody wants to yeah. ask. Because I didn't see it on the tools. I don't I don't think I saw I it on the tools. I don't have a partners page, and I need to add it. I work with some uh, lawyers that we recommend. I work with mm -hmm. a couple insurance agents. So when we look at helping e-commerce businesses succeed, which is our vision statement, is making e-commerce yeah. businesses better, I have relationships with insurance agents. I have relationships with uh, lawyers, which I try to avoid as much as possible, uh, <laughs> with, with marketing companies and people will help Amazon sellers win the buy box. Okay, I have mm -hmm. relationships with people both that both analyze 3PL warehouses and I also have relationships with warehouses. So I've got yeah. a great relationship um, oh I should have had these all listed out this uh, is important this is actually helpful just to hear the different partners people should be thinking about or if they don't have one of them to look into so yeah keep going well yeah well and then it's so there's there's sites that'll let you analyze and compare and say these are my requirements for a warehouse and you tell them and then they'll come back with three to five that are high quality mm -hmm. get good ratings and then you can reach out to because otherwise there's a ton like ship wire is really expensive um, I have a great new relationship that Chad at Scubonet helped me make with uh, with a company in Ireland that will really help sellers move in and do kind of put a toe into selling in the EU okay mm. so they'll help that where you don't want to because if you're gonna do it right everyone's like well I can't sell in Europe until I can put half a million dollars worth of inventory there it just won't work right uh, and but but you don't know. It means you're like that. You gotta you're, test it. A million dollar bet. Well, mm -hmm. you can go in with tens of thousands of dollars. You can't go in with a hundred dollars worth of product. But you can go in with a smaller investment. Mm -hmm. So there's the warehouse side of things. Um, uh, and then there's you know one of the other big ones are uh, e-commerce marketers. And there are a ton of people to avoid. Everybody should avoid Madwire. <laughs> okay, totally a scam. Uh, and their marketing 360 is, I think, their new name. They're also very good at squashing bad reviews on SEO. Some of these companies are really good at doing that. Hmm. Uh, not that I usually say negative things about anybody. Uh, and so those are the different no, it's, uh, relationships. It's good to know if someone's thinking about using one of these services. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got um, uh, virtual CFOs are the key thing. Um, and then peers. Now, I have to say one of the better things is there are some great Facebook groups. Uh, but e-commerce fuel is the uh, forum that I recommend for sellers. There are thousands of sellers. They're really good about keeping uh, vendors out. And seriously, these people lay it on the line. Okay, I've had five e-commerce businesses. I screwed up this way, and then the next one I screwed up this way and this way, and then I screwed up again this way, and then the fourth one was sort of successful, and then, hey, look, the fifth one, I've learned this, but I'm sure there's a new new mistake coming along, mm -hmm. and it's just awesome. It, tons of sharing of information, um, you know, both tips and tricks and the good things and the bad things that go on out there. So there's a number of those resources, mm -hmm. um, and then... Do you go to any conferences? You know, so mm -hmm. I'm speaking at a few conferences. Yeah, what conferences do you recommend and do you attend? It, it's tough. So, so the ones that I'm going to are Jim Cockrum's, which is really more of for for startup and focused people that are on Amazon. Mm -hmm. You know, they're really selling on Amazon and, and people that are looking at rapid growth. And mm -hmm. he provides a lot of great feedback and has a really loyal following. Mm -hmm. um, and that's coming up soon. Um, I'm going to be speaking at the Prosper Show, which is for Amazon sure. sellers. Yeah, I um, talked to James Thompson. Yeah, yeah. let's say uh, James and I just talked a few days ago, and I think that's going to be a great show. I think he's. It really, looks really cool. Yeah. Yeah, he's found some who's who's, and the speakers are really great. Um, and I think it's going to be a higher end show. 
Um, beyond that, the challenge is you go from the space where we live, where I live, which is one to twenty million dollar sellers that are that are growing, which which in my view is small, okay? And then you've got anybody below a million or micro or startup. Mm -hmm. um, any of the other shows typically are for businesses 20 million up. You've got mm -hmm. Target speaking and you've got, and they're great, but IRCE mm -hmm. and- Yeah, some, I'm in Chicago, so I usually, when people come in for IRCE, they're like, hey, let's, let's do something. So yeah, what do you think of IRCE? Um, I, you know, it conflicted with another conference I was at this last year. Um, I have sent him a request. James and I were talking, and I'm sent him a request to speak there. Um, so I'd like to go speak, and it's it's a bigger seller. It just depends on where you are. There are a bunch of smaller ones. So, um, uh, God, I'm blanking on everybody's name. Uh, Skip uh, McGrath puts on a good warehouse conference that's mm. very focused and targeted that sounds, yeah very very niche it, it, yeah. it, it, it's it's well not warehouse but wholesaling it's all on wholesaling and he okay. does some stuff and I, I i'm gonna get to meet him in a few weeks so there are a number of focus the idea is that um one e -com, being an e-commerce business owner can be really lonely your neighbor's not one there, there are a few meetup groups right. but they're kind of dispersed even here in denver uh, there can be more back east and and you know boston or chicago so it's tough to, to interact with them. So I think e-commerce fuel is a great resource, but if you want to get up and go to them, I would be very picky to look to see, are you going to get something out of it? You know, do you want to really check and meet with the vendors and get all the various swag? And are you going to be able to meet the influencers and really talk to them and, and learn and then build relationships? And you can't just go and not talk to anybody. If you're going to go, you got to go and network. And I'm not mm -hmm. talking about the networking where you're trading business cards, everybody's trying to sell each other. You're trying to meet a peer and connect and yeah. go, oh, I'm a dropship seller. You, great, you're another dropship seller. You know, bounce and things off each other and bounce each off each other, and then you can build that support group mm -hmm. and accountability group to help share best practices. So it's if you're going to be in this, it's just harder. You know, yeah. it, but there are a range of conferences. Just keep out for some of the higher end ones because all the tools and they're just not going to pay attention to you if you're selling under twenty million a year because they're mm -hmm. going to charge ten grand a month for their tool. And it just doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. And there's so many great tools that are at the lower end that you can afford and will scale with your business and both evolve rapidly through agile development and like the way Skubon is really rapidly. They've got some great core and they have some great ambitions to continue to do more and more. And that's what a lot of these SaaS cloud solutions can do, that you pay a value that you works for you yeah. and they grow. Um, and they'll evolve with you. And if they don't, there's... 20 other options that you can go look and compare and switch to and hopefully not change too often. Yeah. So Scott, you mentioned owners pay themselves wrong. Mm -hmm. So how do they pay themselves wrong? Oh, um, I mean, oh God, how do I do this from the accounting, from the business owners? So one, if you're a partnership, okay, all of that stuff's running into your personal, you know, uh, your personal tax return anyway, and you mm -hmm. can't really screw that up. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's what um, I was thinking. Like, how can someone screw this up that bad? Well, no, but I'm now, sure you see it. Well, so that's the if you're a partnership, um, you can do that. There are other rules about you have to pay the partners equal amounts and a few other things. So you need to be talking to mm -hmm. a CPA at the beginning, and then in Q4 to make sure you're doing things right, and then and then you know get things going for the next year. Uh, the other thing is is what we see is that not so much they're paying themselves wrong, they pay their employees wrong. Okay, these are first time business owners. They don't know the rules for setting people up. They don't do background checks. They don't. They they think they're a 1099, but they work for them 50 hours a week, and you tell them exactly what to do. They're an employee. That's one of the big things mm -hmm. is blurring that line. It's one yeah. thing when you someone off Odesk or Elance. Now the big shift for companies, and you do this with the CPA is. Is it better for you from a tax perspective to go from an LLC as a taxed as a partnership or a sole proprietor to an S Corp? Mm -hmm. okay. Which means that instead of having one personal tax return, you have a personal tax return and a business tax return. Yeah. Okay. And in that case, the owners have to pay themselves a reasonable salary. Okay. But if you're doing shipping, you should pay yourself, you know, 12, 14, 16, whatever you would pay someone to do your job. Okay. I see. But if you're pricing and everything else, it's what you would replace, and that's your base pay, and then you pay payroll tax on that. Right. Okay? Now, you might pay yourself two, three grand a month 
salary, you can still pay yourself a 10 grand disbursement every month and be raking in the bucks, okay? But you have to do that piece. Now, some people, what they do is they set up as an S Corp if they're not making a ton of money yet and they pay themselves what they can throughout the year and in November and December they just fix it all. They just pay all the payroll tax at the end of the year and that's all fine. That's just logistically how you do it. So, mm -hmm. it and the decision is, is you need to ask CPA to look. If you're starting to make real money, you can save thousands of dollars in tax by becoming an S Corp and that's mm -hmm. the reason you would do it. Mm -hmm. So when do people qualify to use Catching clouds. <laughs> so we work with established e-commerce businesses. We don't make sense until a business is doing at least fifty thousand per month with reasonable margins. Because if they're not, they should be spending their money on marketing and inventory, not paying themselves. If they're yeah. at that level, they're still in kind of that growth stage, and they need to do that. So we're looking at that. We typically are working with more complex multi-channel sellers, people that, that need help, that have a lot going on. Yeah. Okay, lots of purchase orders. They're on Amazon, eBay, Jet, Rakuten. Um, they've got multiple shopping carts. Um, or they're looking to scale because the best and most profitable use of the business owner's time is probably either selling B2B to clients and, and setting up a, a connection with Target or Bye Bye Baby or somewhere else or um, it's or they just they're at the point where they're making enough money they don't want to do the accounting anymore okay and then they want to be ready and understand that they're outsourcing it but our whole point is we put all the data in the cloud okay so it's visible they can log on at two o'clock in the morning and look at their books our virtual bookkeepers touch everybody's books daily so we download we ask them for supporting receipts we update accounts payable so we do all that in a real time enough basis and we have the, the resources to do that. And the other benefit of an outsourcer versus hiring a single virtual assistant or hiring somebody is we have a whole team. If one of our people's sick, you don't notice. Our, we cover. Right. And that's that outsource relationship of we can scale and have that. And then we have a virtual controller that not only closes the books and digs into cost of goods sold and we figure out all the weird stuff that Amazon did with their inventory we file sales tax for them is that we do all the work but their federal and state income tax and then we meet with our clients including when they don't we like have to chase them down to say you have to look at your books you have to see how your business you at least once a month you have to look at what's going on in your business and then we educate them this is what's going on we yeah. see this and they tell us what's changing in their business and it's that collaborative relationship there um, is is the part we like we consider ourselves part of our clients business yeah. okay we have direct relationships. They have people they know by name. We know them by name. We have a bunch that we interact with a lot, and some we do via email lighter. But it's when you're ready to have somebody involved in your business, and you're you know you're going to go from either 50k or 100k a month or more, and you're looking at continuing to grow. You need to have a solid grasp on your finances. So you're making great decisions every day, every week. Yeah. So, you know, Scott, we talked about some sales tax issues. We talked about some yep. payroll issues. We talked about software. What have you seen people do wrong or were you to help them clean up kind of inventory type issues or expense management? Um, um, so inventory, is, it's kind of a, it's, it's when we're setting up a cloud inventory solution for the first time. Okay. So, they have costs either spread out on you know 50 different purchase orders or they have a few costs here and there the big thing is is rationalizing the data and then of course making them do a physical count one of the benefits of a cloud inventory solution is if you do set it up right you do a physical count it keeps track of everything and then you need to do a physical count maybe quarterly maybe mm -hmm. twice depending on what you're doing okay yeah. so so keep in mind that's another benefit there so first you've got to do a physical count and what do they have? Right. Okay, um, and then it's a matter of um, analyzing the data and updating the costs and saying which money, which products did you make money on, which products did you sell, you know, make money on and sell a lot of. It's yeah. focusing on those. It's kind of a basic thing. So it's really just getting it all recorded in a cloud inventory and setting that up, doing a physical count, and then staying on top of it. Where the technology helps with a lot of that. Um, and then you can look at automation. Depending if you're doing a lot of shipping, there are some you know tools that, that focus on warehouse management more than cloud inventory, and you implement barcoding. And I'm always looking for those different efficiencies. Mm -hmm, so it's, mm -hmm. it's those kind of things to help get past the human nature of it. Some of this stuff is is just a pain to deal with, 
and it's making it simpler so there's a standard process so that when you go to do it, you know it's going to take you two hours, okay, versus, oh, uh, the last time I did it, it took me three weekends, okay, I lost three weekends to doing whatever. It's defining those things and getting it through it. Um, other, otherwise, it's just a matter, I mean, everybody caught on that Amazon um, raised their storage costs, and so I know tons of sellers over the last month or so, last six weeks, have been selling off anything that's been in inventory and discounting everything, and so Amazon kind of forced everybody to clean up their mm -hmm. inventory. Right. Because they realized they're, they were, they're finally, now, they were probably already losing money at the lower rates before, but since Amazon bumped it, it kind of forced everybody, and this is what Put Amazon- Put some pressure on, yeah. Put some pressure on them to focus on products that turn over faster, okay? Which is the way Amazon works and actually is good for your business. If you're mm -hmm. making it and you turn it over faster, you make more profit faster. So uh, it's those things. Um, uh, uh, the other thing is if you're a drop shipper, if you have to be careful about sales taxes, what will happen is California and other states will make the drop shipper collect sales tax because of where they have it. So you'll, you'll sell an order, you'll have X amount of profit, and then you'll know you're going to pay a certain amount for shipping, but then they charge you $100 for sales tax, okay? That you can get back if you don't have a sales tax license. So a lot of people will register in California as an Amazon FBA seller so that anytime they drop ship from their suppliers, wherever they are in the U.S., into California, they have a sales tax exemption certificate and they don't have to pay sales tax because it can mm -hmm. screw up your profitability on all of your California uh, sales for that way. So that's another mm -hmm. inventory issue. With what you do, you have to know way too much. This is, you know, it's like <laughs> every state's probably different. It's, yeah. it's a nightmare. Um, I want to know sort of how you even got into this e-commerce world. Like I look at your background, like I said, it's physics, math, computer science. And I look at your director of engineering. You did unified communications programming. I have no idea what that is. <laughs> when, you're, when, you're, when you were in Culver City High School, what did you want to do? What did you want to be? Oh, no, I was I, – uh, everybody else was on track, which I trained on the weekends. I worked at Computerland of West L.A. I built some of the first IBM PCs and XTs to hit the market in the early 80s. So right. I've been playing with computers since I was right. five, which right. I can – myself, which was in 73. So I've always been working on computers, right. and, which was a big deal then because not everybody had computers. And, yeah. And uh, uh, they were stupid expensive and everything else. So What did you want to do? What did you want to be when you grew up? I that really, I've always wanted to be a, well a computer geek and yeah. a consultant, and I have really fallen in. It's being a consultant. It's helping understand a topic and apply it and solve problems. So if you look, I got into security for a long while and figured out I'm a CISSP, and and that's fun. How are hackers getting in and what's going on? I like solving problems, right. and whatever I get involved in, I get really passionate about. Okay, and if you had asked me, would I have owned an accounting company? Okay. And that I'd be focused on e-commerce. E-commerce, not so much, okay? But, you know, I'm not into selling products mm -hmm. and, and packaging products. I've always been a consultant doing services. Right. So about four or five, about five years ago, I was at a global multinational British corporation. I'm an entrepreneur and an idea guy in a company that takes three years to do something that small business owner entrepreneurs do in a week, okay? Right. Drive me crazy. I was the expert. I got to fly around the world and do cool stuff, but... Right. Oh, it drove me crazy. So my focus is I get passionate about solving problems. So I tend to focus on e-commerce business process optimization because that's what's fun. Right. How can I automate and take technology, yeah. apply it, help solve problems and build efficiencies into business leveraging technology to help them make more successful? Because I'm partnered my, with my wife, we're focused on the accounting side. So I do a lot of time consulting to companies like Scubana and the other cloud inventory and a number of e-commerce companies on how to build better integrations to accounting, both right. to name all the terms right, because these companies like Shopify are, is great, they're great companies, but if they're, they, they're trying to sell a tool and it's to generate e-commerce, which means they're generating money, and then they forget that accountants need to collect that volume of data coming off the back end right. to help businesses know what's going on. And that's the problem I'm really trying to solve. I'm passionate about solving problems, and I enjoy solving problems and becoming an expert and talking about stuff. And how do I translate that? How can I take this complex topic like sales tax and just say, mm -hmm. look, here's where you have Nexus. How to automate it, yeah. Here's your, here's your, yeah, and here's how to automate it. And so I get to be an expert. I get to talk about it. And there are things that I, it's fun about. Now, just to let you know on sales tax, I've learned I'm an expert in sales tax process. 
I'm an expert in sales tax technology and how technology that will automate that process. I have about three or four SALT sales and local tax experts that are experts and lawyers that I talk to because I don't dig in to figure out whether or not edible underwear is a food or clothing <laughs> that state. Okay. But, you know, I don't, your I, wife will get all over that if she sees edible underwear on your on your credit yeah, card. Yeah, she's going to be really mad when she sees all that. Yeah, that's the kind of thing I don't show up on a credit card. I got to cash and say, no, I must have spent it at Wendy's. You know, I, I didn't ever envision the words edible underwear to cut, to ever enter this conversation in this interview. <laughs> <laughs> um, Scott, when you take on a client, what's the process that you – what do you start off with, with doing with them? Obviously, they should be looking – with this stuff without you, but, but obviously what's the kind of the process that you take someone through? Uh, well, we meet people, they find us on the web or through, you know, a, a something like this and they come to talk to us and I'll answer all their questions and figure out, get to know their business, what they're selling, what type of seller are they, drop ship or FBA or whatever, and get a feel if they're a good fit for us and, and how they're doing. Um, then what we do is we start with an initial assessment, which we charge for. Okay, so uh, we charge for the initial assessment in which we get a copy of their QuickBooks file or all their spreadsheets. We log on to Amazon. We set up some of the tools we talk about mm -hmm. to get a snapshot of their business. Okay, and we spend time uh, following the Simon Sinek. It's all about the why. Finding out why are they doing this? Mm. Is this to fund a hobby? A lot of people have a business that funds a hobby. One of our clients does uh, fishing gear. Okay, great fish shop. Ed, Ed's Fly Shop can buy stuff so it funds him you know his life and he gets all this product and it means he can go on fishing trips all the time okay right. so it funds the hobby okay and you have other people right. that believe in their brands and other things along those lines mm -hmm. um, and so that we figure out their why okay and then we come back to them with two numbers um, so and then we come back to them with a report that they could give their current account and say, "Hey, these people found these thirty things wrong in our books. Some of them trivial, some of them big. Okay, right. um, and a plan. And then we give them two numbers: one for us to onboard them. That's to convert them from QuickBooks or spreadsheets or whatever over to zero, and set up cloud inventory if they don't have it, or optimize their cloud inventory and get everything caught up to today. Okay, and that tends to be a big chunk of money. And everything we do is fixed fee." And then we um, then we have our um, and the initial assessment. The pricing is a thousand dollars, and then setup cleanup is two to ten thousand dollars. If we're going back, maybe a year, a little more. If we're going back two or three years to redo accounting that was never done right, it goes up. Right. And then our monthly fees are a thousand to five thousand dollars a month. Everything we do is monthly. It's a thirty day cancellation, so they can fire us in thirty days, and we can fire them. Okay, it's both ways. Right. Right. <laughs> um, and then we look at a fixed fee service so that they know what their costs are. So in a lot of cases, they might evolve and grow and we might nudge it up a little bit, but we'll quickly get to a point where it doesn't matter if we're pulling in 200, 2,000 or 20,000 transactions, mm -hmm. it's data. We're going to be, might seem expensive at first, but once they get going, we're going to be a fixed cost in their business and they can double and triple and become more profitable and good for them. So. so I have so many questions, so limited time. Like I'm not going to ask this, but I, I would love to to want to hear. But I think it's interesting to talk about some of the good and some of the challenges working with a family member or spouse. I think a lot of people, you know, um, deal with that. Probably initially, they have friends or family or even a spouse. Um, I know uh, you have another meeting, so I'm not going to go into that. But I think that's an interesting topic um, that's on my mind. Um, well, I can give you a short version okay, yeah. of minutes, which is uh, there are pros and cons, so it's great. I totally trust and respect my wife. She's a power user. She's wicked smart. She's great with our clients and educating them on business and accounting and everything else, but we spend a crazy amount of time together, okay? Yeah. So, so we're business partners and we work together all day, okay? And then we switch to being parents and our kids come home from school and we're parenting and driving kids around and doing all of that. Uh, and then then we might be a couple or then we might take off on our own and then we're individuals for five minutes <laughs> and then we're a couple. Um, and then right. it's tough. We, we, uh, we, had a, we, went on, we went away for a weekend and we said, okay, we're not going to talk about the business or the kids. That's impossible. No, I'm just kidding. We, we, we had a very comfortable silence for about 
45 minutes. And you <laughs> telling your stories that you forgot. Like I told her stories about when I was a child and high school and other stuff. You end up redoing those stories because you don't remember even though you told them to each other. Right. Uh, it's good. Um, there are times we have to get away and, and separate it. Um, I've talked to people that, that a lot of people, probably 40 or 50% of people that work with their spouse in some capacity or other, and the other half say they couldn't do it. They kill each other. Right. Um, and for the people that do, it works out really well. I mean, all of our eggs are in one basket in this company, but right. we're in it together. And so it's, uh, it's really fun. What's the hardest part about the business, your business? Uh, um, it's the same as any other business. It, it, it's all the things. It's not one thing. Okay, so we're currently hiring. So finding the right people is critical to our business because we're a services business that requires on virtual bookkeepers and virtual controllers. Right. Okay, um, and finding the right people, even though they get to work virtually and work from home wherever they are, right. um, and then it's finding clients and finding the right clients, mm -hmm. um, and then managing it. But we're really—I mean, there are some things that are working really well. We've had a lot of our clients for quite a while. We're looking for long-term clients that are happy to pay us every month. They come back every month because we're providing value to them. We have relationships with them and we move forward um, and then it's all the other pieces you know it's managing our cash flow it's it's doing all the things that all the other businesses need to do and try to do it right um, and uh, just stay focused yeah. so, you know. so Scott I appreciate your time this has been very very valuable uh, you're giving very expensive advice for free so I appreciate that and um, you know, I have one last piece that I want to talk about. And since it's the Scubani Commerce Mastery Series, my last piece of the question and, and portion of the interview is, you know, we've talked about a lot of things. What should we leave people with as some of just things to start on and take action on right now to increase their e-commerce business? Um, I, I'd have to say automation. Yeah. Okay, you need to use technology. There's a lot of data flying around from shopping carts and 3PL sites and PayPal transactions, and there's a lot going on. You need the right technology that provides structure to your business. I've been looking for quite a while for my go-to, you know, top uh, three to five cloud inventory products instead of, well, it could be any one of these 30. And Scubana, very quickly, we've got one of our larger clients using Scubana. He's very happy with it. Um, and um, they're in my top five, you know, mm. and they're probably my top two um, because of the automation and their approach to solving the whole problem. It's like one of the reasons I like Zen Payroll. Zen Payroll does a great job around payroll because they do it all. Like, they, mm. they, they didn't leave any part out. So people might get mm. annoyed that we don't do federal and state income taxes, but we chose not to do that. But, but it's the we solve the problem. And Scubana mm. solves most of it now and is rapidly solving all the other problems to build that automation for businesses to scale yeah. and then not have to change cloud inventory in the future. Yeah. And they're really cool guys. They're fun to interact with. They are. Um, so my last question, Scott, and just before I ask it, tell people where should they check you out? Where should they go online? Yeah, so we're catchingclouds.net, so www.catchingclouds.net. Uh, or you can send an email to info at catchingclouds.net and it'll come to us. Please follow us at, at catchingclouds. We, we are constantly blogging and tweeting and pri trying to share information and share guidance and help businesses that are either smaller, uh, do it on their own and grow to the point where they can work with us, or share those tips. We're really all about sharing the information. Yeah. And when you're ready to not do the work, then there are people like us and a few of our peers. We're at the point where we're teaching other accountants about e-commerce. Mm -hmm. uh, but no, come see us, follow us. We're really trying to write blogs, interact with us, ask me questions. Yeah. So I wanted to, to find, you know, it to kind of end with the biggest success story, how you helped the business turn around. I was <laughs> reading testimonials, uh, video conference gear, 911 health shop, spider trick. What's your favorite success story where you help someone turn around? Uh, I, I have to say, right now, it's uh, Three Little Birds, hmm. um, which is one of our clients. So Leah is younger, young entrepreneur, and had started, she's just got a knack for picking the right clothing that women like to buy, hmm. okay, and in her age group and everything else. And she had a really good going business when we met her last year, and she was smart enough to say, I have no idea what's going on with the accounting or whatever else. And since she's younger, and a lot of entrepreneurs and e-commerce businesses, it's their third or fourth or fifth business, okay? This is her first one. And we've been able to help her put in structure and coach her around business and connect her. 
to a CPA to fix all of her taxes and get everything going. Um, and then the other part is she said, I'm going to open a store in, in uh, Lafayette and go brick and mortar as well as online. And we coached her through some of it. And she said, no, I know it's going to do it. She opened the store and she matched her online sales, which were good, in her store the first month. Wow. Okay. And so it was a combination of her, her core of being really good and her working her butt off as, a, uh, as an entrepreneur yeah. okay, and a mom uh, and, and really pulling it together. And then us keeping tabs as she made these big changes in her business on the finances and speaking up and saying, hey, you need to watch your cash flow here. Don't pay too much for rent there. And she listened to our background guidance. So we were part of that process. We don't just record stuff and talk to them once a month. If we see something wrong, we speak up. Yeah, and so yeah. that's been one that's, that's been uh, fun. So a lot of it's been her, uh, absolutely. And as the accountants in the background, we're catching all the things she's got going on, pulling it together and showing her not just her gut feel, this is what's really going on financially in her business. Um, and we do that with a lot of our sellers, you know, and the relationships we've built with them is, is great. But that's the one that, that I'm, I'm really psyched how well she's doing. Yeah. Scott, this has been hugely valuable. This could go on for another hour, but I will, uh, I will <laughs> let you get to your hike slash meeting or whatever. But, yeah. um, but thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it. No, thank you. This has been a lot of fun. You have a wonderful day. Thanks, Scott. All right. Take care.